Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Essentials video number 12. This is on free energy and how life requires free energy. Now, I'm going to assume that you know what free energy is. If you don't, make sure you watch the video that I made called Gibbs Free Energy, um, and it talks you through that process in a real uh, conceptual kind of a way. But on our planet, we get free energy from the sun. In other words, we get a constant supply of energy from the sun in the form of sunlight. Um, and plants are able to use that to convert that energy into sugars, which we then break down. And so if it weren't for the sun, and if it weren't that available energy from the sun, life on our planet wouldn't exist, at least the way it does um, today. And so today I'm going to talk about how we utilize uh, free energy. And so life requires free energy. Where do we get that free energy? We get it from the environment. Um, so we get it for the most part from the sun. How do we utilize that energy? We utilize it through a series of, of chemical processes called metabolism. So it's the sum of all the chemical reactions inside our body. A specific one I'm going to talk about today is called glycolysis, and it's a series of chemical reactions. It always goes in a certain sequence, and the neat thing about it is that you can jump into it at different points depending on what kind of, uh, um, what kind of energy or what kind of uh, nutrients you're getting. Um, next, I'm going to talk specifically about how we organize, grow, and reproduce. So these are the three major things that we get from, from uh, free energy. How we organize our life, how we get bigger, how we develop, and then how do we finally pass on our genes? Because that's the goal of all living things, is to pass your genes on to the next generation. To do this, we must maintain homeostasis, which is an internal environment that remains stable. Now, there's an interesting relationship between the metabolism rate and your body weight, and I'll, I'll finally talk about that. Now, let's say we have some extra free, free energy. What do we do with that? We can use that for storage, so we can use it later. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about in this podcast is disruptions to uh, free energy. If we get disruptions, disruptions to the free energy that we have in an individual, that can lead to death, but also those disruptions can lead to changes in a population or even an ecosystem. So that's what I want to talk about. First thing that you should know is that life requires order. Um, and, in other words, it requires a, a lack of entropy, or a lack of disorder. Um, once we become disordered, then we eventually die. So to maintain that, we require a constant supply of energy. So for example, your brain is the picture I have here. 20% of the energy inside your body is going to just maintaining uh, the nervous system. And so that you can actually, even though you might not think you're thinking, um, you're actually use, using a huge amount of that energy just to maintain those nerves at a static state, uh, yet alone to maintain the order inside our body. Now there's two thermodynamic laws that I should briefly talk about, and you're very familiar probably with the first one. First law of thermodynamics says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but it can be transferred. And so what that means is energy from the sun is converted to energy in plants, in food. We eventually eat that. We convert that to ATP, and then we use that energy to maintain order. And so that energy that's, that you're using right now originally came from uh, the sun. Uh, we don't, we don't uh, make energy. We don't destroy energy. But all that energy is eventually going to end up as uh, heat or a lower form of energy. So that's pretty straightforward. Second law of thermodynamics gives some people fits. And second law of thermodynamics says that this, that every time we convert energy, we increase the entropy of the universe. Now, what is entropy? Entropy is disorder of the universe. And so from the origins of uh, our universe, from that first Big Bang to the formation of uh, the galaxies and the evolution of those through time, the randomness of the universe is going to get uh, greater and greater and greater. In other words, we're going to become less ordered uh, as a universe. Now, what's interesting about that is some people have a problem with that, and they say that evolution violates that. They say that since entropy is increasing over time, how could you get something that is actually adding to the order of the universe, like evolution, uh, running almost in the opposite direction for that. Um, so uh, example they say is how could you get the formation of an eye um, from something as simple as just photoreceptors if things become greater and greater as far as their level of disorder over time. They'd be totally right if this was a closed system. In other words, since we constantly get energy uh, from the sun, our planet does, and a constant supply of energy from the sun, we can actually become evolved or we can gain greater order 
But we do that by increasing the disorder of the rest of the uh, universe. And so the second law of thermodynamics only applies to a closed system. And since the Earth is far from a closed system, it doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics. I love this progression right here on how we could go to the eye, because that was an argument that people had for evolution. How could you, what's the point of having, for example, like a half of an eye? How could you have gone from simple uh, photoreceptors to an eye? Well, if you think about it, that each of these steps give you an advantage. So let's say we have an organism that can just sense light, so like a flatworm, it only goes goes where there is um, darkness so it can avoid being dried out. Well imagine if that membrane just gets folded in on itself. What does that give you? Well these photoreceptors can see things coming over here. These things can see things coming over here and so what you get is you can actually sense motion. And so the neat thing about evolution is that each of these steps gives an advantage to that uh, organism. And also we see organisms that have each of these different types of eyes and so I think that's fascinating. Uh, and it doesn't fly in the face of second law of thermodynamics. It's an open system and so we become more and more ordered at the expense of the disorder of our planet. So I wanted to talk mostly about metabolism today and so how we utilize that energy. Um, first process is called glycolysis and this is shared by almost all living things on our planet so that suggests it goes pretty far back. So to start glycolysis which is the breakdown of glucose into pyruvate you have to actually add a little bit of ATP but eventually what you do is you break it into two molecules of pyruvate and you release more ATP and then a little bit of NADH. ADH. And we'll talk more about that in cellular respiration. Now the process is not as simple as this. Uh, in, like anything in chemistry, uh, it's much more complex than that. And so let me show you the different steps in glycolysis. Glycolysis actually looks like this. So this would be right here. Let me get a different color. This would be glucose, which I just showed you, and then this would be pyruvate, and we're making ATP, and we're making NADH uh, down here as well. Um, and so there's a series of intermediates or steps that we must go through uh, just to make that pyruvate. Now, this is found in almost all living things. And so bacteria, for example, we use glycolysis um, just like we do. And it would be a pain if we ate lasagna and we had to have one uh, pathway to release that energy. And we drank milk or ate strawberries. And since they each have a different sugar, it'd be, it'd be a waste if we couldn't just use this one process. And so glycolysis is ubiquitous. It's used by almost all living things. So the neat thing is simple sugars like glucose enter right here. Galactose uh, is, is found in dairy products and it will actually jump into this glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, fructose can jump in farther down the pathway. And glycogen, glycogen is a, a number of different sugar molecules that we store. It's, we use it for storage in, in living things. It can jump in right here. And so I don't want you to memorize any of these intermediates. It's important in glycolysis that you know where we start and where we begin. But also know this, that it's a, a systematic uh, pathway and you can jump into it at different uh, points along the way. So what is free energy for? Well, free energy really does these three things in living, in living organisms. It allows us to organize, it allows us to grow, and then it allows us to reproduce. Now, like I said, there's an interesting relationship between metabolism and the size. Uh, and it kind of goes like this. An elephant, which is a large um, organism has a relatively low metabolism. And a mouse, which is really small, is going to have a high metabolism. Well, why is that? Uh, one of the reasons why is that it has a hard time maintaining that homeostasis or that stable internal environment. It loses a lot of its energy to heat, and so it has to crank up its metabolism to accommodate for that. And so what do we use uh, free energy for? What do we use metabolism for? We use it to organize. So we could say organization from the level of macromolecules all the way to um, organelles, cells, organs, organ systems inside our body. We constantly are using uh, an influx of free energy to do that. And remember the coinage in life is ATP or adenosine triphosphate. As we break that down into ADP, um, that releases free energy and we can use it to do things. Uh, for example, 
example, to maintain the sodium potassium pump that, that uh, fires the nerves inside your brain. We also grow throughout our life, and that's not only development from this embryo to the fetus to the baby. We also have to replace all those cells that are dying uh, throughout our life, and so we use free energy to do that. Um, so we're using a lot of energy just to organize ourselves to grow and then maintain this homeostasis. We use extra energy to do reproduction. And so the flowers of a plant are not there to maintain order or to grow. They're used to pass their genes to the next generation, to pass uh, sperm uh, and fertilize egg. And so uh, reproduction is another way that we use metabolism inside our body. Um, we always maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is that internal uh, stable environment environment. Now these turtles right here are uh, ectotherms and what that means is they maintain their body temperature um, by using their external environment and so a turtle will be the same temperature as their surroundings and so since metabolism is a bunch of chemical reactions they don't run really well at low temperature and so these guys are basking or sitting in the glow of sunlight to warm up their body so they can actually use that. And then finally, we can store energy. I would said before that we can use it to store sugar and glycogen inside our body, but plants will store that in starch. Um, so potatoes are made up of uh, starch, which is a bunch of sugar molecules, and then they're using those to grow. And you see that if you leave the potatoes in your closet too long, they'll actually start to grow out of the closet if you forget about them. And so the last thing I want to talk about is what happens if we have disruptions to the amount of free energy that we have. Well, if I get disruptions to the amount of energy that I have, in other words, I quit eating, that eventually leads to death. And that's what always happens if we have a uh, decrease in the amount of free energy. Um, but the, it gets more complex than that in life. In other words, this is a food web. It shows how the plants or the autotrophs in a, a uh, population are fed on by herbivores and, and carnivores uh, or heterotrophs above that. And so if we have a decrease in the amount of free energy, so a decrease in light, for example, that's going to impact the plants and it's, in, in, it's going to impact this food web above them. Now, um, it gets really complex. Complex. And so uh, the, the example I have here, um, I gathered from uh, Jared Diamond's book, which is Collapse. It's a great read. Um, but this is Easter Island, and you're probably famous. Uh, you know Easter Island for these giant statues that they built there at one time. But what you probably didn't know about Easter Island is that it used to look a little bit like Hawaii. Not quite as lush, but there were trees over the whole of Easter Island. And the people that moved to Easter Island, they're pretty isolated, ended up cutting down every tree on the uh, island. As a result of that, the population crashed. And so when um, modern humans found the people on Easter Island, they were just holding on by a thread. Why is that? Well, they were decreasing the amount of free energy, and they had done that by decreasing the... Um, the plants on that, which they should have been using for uh, life. And so they also couldn't make transportation, and the whole thing fell in on itself. But we could point to a decrease in the amount of free energy that led to the collapse of Easter Island. And so that's free energy. It's, it's required for life, uh, and I hope that's helpful.